Uh, so today I'm pleased to introduce selected authors of the recently released book, Dri Drivers of Landscape Change in the Northwest Boreal Region. This book, co-authored by 65 experts in Alaska and Northwest Canada, addresses what is driving change in our lands, waters, and wildlife, and includes impacts, future projections, information gaps, and implica implications for management and ways of life for Indigenous and rural communities. Seven or maybe more, uh, I have seven names here of the book's contributors are here with us today. See Joe, and apologies in advance if I mispronounce anyone's name. Um, See Joe Smith of the Northwest Boreal Partnership, Amanda Sesser of 21 Sustainability, Tora Jorgensen of Alaska Ecoscience, Scott Slocomb of Wilfrid Laurier University, Nancy Fresco of the International Arctic Research Center, Annette Watson, College of Charleston, and last but not least, uh, Douglas Clark University of Saskatchewan. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't go through bios for each of these speakers, but suffice it to say, uh, there's a lot of interesting and relevant knowledge and exp experience around the presenter table today. And I'll turn the microphone uh, over now to the presenters. Welcome. Wonderful. Thanks, Sabrina. Um, I'm going to start us off just to introduce everyone to the Northwest Boreal Partnership. Uh, my name is Liana Hefner, and I am the partnership director, which uh, means that I have the best job in the world because I get to work with so many amazing people in Alaska and in Northwest Canada. And um, what we are is we're a group of people who work in government agencies, uh, Indigenous organizations, including also tribes and First Nations, um, universities, and NGOs. And we've all come together to do work on issues around climate change adaptation, land and resource management and stewardship, um, and uh, you know, general conservation. And um, this work began back in 2012 when the partnership was formed. And that was part of actually a large network um, that the US federal government through the US Fish and Wildlife Service um, stood up and supported to create these regional conservation partnerships. So um, we had you know, support from government, but really it was the actual partners who come together that really guided the work and understood this concept of we're stronger together than we are alone. Um, there's opportunities to collaborate, leverage one another, share information, build relationships, build trust, um, and address some of these really big complex problems. So um, it's been an amazing organization to work with. Um, my predecessor, Amanda, Dr. Amanda Susser, is here to tell you about where this particular effort came from to create this book, which really is actually a, a tool more than anything. Um, and it's meant to be used as opposed to sitting on a shelf gathering dust. Um, it's got incredible amount of information, but it's also organized in such a way that it's very useful for people who are working on all of these issues and to better understand what's driving change in our environment, what are the management implications, um, what are some you know, key information gaps, etc. So it's a, it's a super cool effort. Um, I'll let Amanda talk more about it and then um, our, some of our co-authors are here to then do a little bit of like a dive into some of the topics within the book so you can get a taste. But um, also, uh, you know, hopefully by the end of this, you'll be convinced that this is something maybe that you want to have um, at your fingertips and sitting on your desk um, that can help, help you out with the work that you do. Um, and with that, oh, and I'll just say, um, if you want any more information on our partnership or about the book, you can check us out on our website. It's uh, northwestboreal.org. Okay, Amanda, take it away. Great. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Let me see. There we go. Okay, yeah, well, um, thank you, Liana, and thank you, Sabrina, and everyone for hosting us this today. It's a real honor to be here, and I can't say how happy it makes me to see so many familiar names on the webinar. I want to say hi to Phil Burton, and uh, he's one of the, the co-authors, and 
and uh, co-editors actually on, on this project as well. And it's just such a pleasure always working with folks in Whitehorse uh, from, from um, throughout my career. So it's just, it's great to be here today. As Liana mentioned, we are here to talk about a volume of work that we have worked on for about the last five years. And it's, um, uh, it's a book that came out last year in 2019 called Drivers of Landscape Change in the Northwest Boreal Region. And it's um, uh, a synthesis, not just a summary, but a synthesis of a lot of information. And it's organized around drivers of change in uh, the Northwest Boreal landscape. In 2012, as Liana mentioned, when the partnership was first being stood up, we worked uh, with folks in Whitehorse, Yellowknife, uh, Northern BC, Fairbanks and Anchorage and, and people that live in between to identify what are the major drivers of change on the landscape that are causing both social and ecological changes. And then how are those changes impacting our management decisions? One of the things that we, um, that right from the beginning, our steering committee said, hey, we would really like to know the state of science, the state of the environment, and especially in relationship to the changes that are occurring. So it, this was really a partnership driven effort. It was brought up as a shared need among the stakeholders. As Sabrina mentioned, there's uh, 60, she said 65 authors. That's even more than I have on my slides. So that's a, even more amazing that we have that many people came, that came together to, to work on this project. It, it's really humbling that that many people said yes when we reached out and said what it was that we were doing. And uh, so thank you all. I do definitely want to say thank you to the, the, all the folks who contributed their knowledge and their time to this effort. The format of this book is that each chapter has at least two co-authors, most have many more, but at least two co-authors, one from the US side, the Alaska side, and another from the Northwest Canada side. And that's done on purpose to make sure that we talk about both US and Canada subjects. And also that it's just fostering collaboration. This partnership is all about working together. It did take us five years to make it. It was one of those projects that um, started off, um, you know, it's a, it's a big project, it's a big undertaking, but we got to the finish line a few years after, after starting the project, we thought we were done. And it ended up um, becoming a, a, a political uh, subject that we were not expecting. Uh, so with the, the last administration in the US, the, the whole project actually got, the, got um, uh, the X. <laughs> and we were pretty shocked, but we didn't stop there. We said, no, that this is even more reason why we need to make sure that this information gets into people's hands. And so the University of Alaska Press uh, picked it up and we're very grateful to, um, to those folks. We also, given the little extra timeline, we're able to add in a lot more social sciences to the book kind of in the later stage. So um, Dr. Don Magnus brought in a lot of the social drivers of change and um, you know, we talk about things about meaningfully engaging communities as Annette Watson will talk about here in a minute. Uh, but we also, we're looking at things like communication as being a driver of change. Just the way we talk to each other and the way we talk about science is not itself a driver of change. So again, I wanna thank the co-authors and I wanna give a special shout out to Carl Markon and Amy Posowitz for keeping this effort moving. Uh, Carl, even after he retired, worked on this project. There are eight, chapters and each chapter has or uh, has multiple sections in it. Um, the intended audience is natural resource managers or interested community members. As, as Liana mentioned at the beginning, this project is really about taking you know, decades and decades worth of scientific research and putting it at your fingertips so that you don't have to spend decades and decades reading, uh, reading the papers and, and doing the research yourself is uh, in, intended to be easily accessible, so it avoids jargon. And uh, the template is uh, each section starts with key findings, covers historical trends, current status, and future projections, and then ends with a bulleted list of information gaps. And you might be wondering where you can buy the this book. Um, the main 
Uh, distributor is the University of Chicago Press. They work in conjunction with the University of Alaska Press, but you can also find it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, or your favorite independent bookseller. And one thing that Liana and I just Googled it uh, prior to, to giving this presentation, and we were really surprised to see, you know, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Goodreads, you know, come up with, with, um, with this volume. So hopefully it's reaching a, an audience far and wide. Yeah, and it's only 30 US dollars. So it's actually really reasonably priced, um, which is great because we want it to be accessible. Um, thanks so much, Amanda, and uh, for that, that overview and the history of how this came about. And now we're gonna dive into a bit of the science, uh, the natural science that's in the book. So uh, Dr. Tor Jorgensen, um, who's a permafrost research expert is gonna talk for a few minutes about um, some of the highlights in the permafrost section of the book. Are we up and running? Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay. I'd like to start off in the icy world below ground to set a foundation for some of the other talks. And uh, first we're gonna chill out and then hopefully we'll warm up to the subject as we go along. First, I'd like to just provide a little foundation discussing the three main permafrost characteristics. First, we have a, a thermal regime that uh, drives the temperatures. And these temperatures can fluctuate from winter cooling to summer warming and creates a, a layer of seasonally frozen and freezing ground. Then these temperatures propagate through a gradient below ground and they reach a depth at maybe 15 to 25 meters where the temperatures no longer fluctuate. And we refer to this as the zero amplitude uh, temperature. And then if you follow the gradient on down, you'll, you'll meet up with the uh, geothermal gradient and you get to the base of the permafrost. Uh, so it's frozen permafrost above and unfrozen below. And this in the boreal, it often ranges about 50 to 100 meters thick uh, for permafrost. And then these temperatures interact with a variety of soil textures ranging from peat to silt, sand, or gravel. And together, the temperatures and the soil textures uh, control what kind of ground ice can form from segregated ice to massive ice. And then the types and the volumes of ice determine how the landscape responds upon thawing. Uh, we've been benefiting from a remarkable 30-year-plus uh, record of deep uh, ground temperatures initiated by Tom Oster Camp and then continued to be maintained by Vlad Romanovsky uh, that forms a gradient across the, the boreal region in Alaska. And these deep temperatures kind of at the zero amplitude depth reflect the north-south gradient in air temperatures. So temperatures can range from minus three to the north uh, down to near zero uh, towards the south. And these temperatures have risen nearly one degree centigrade since the mid 1980s uh, in the northern boreal portion of the region. And then in the southern boreal or kind of mid to southern boreal uh, temperatures are approaching the thawing phase in the south. So they're getting uh, to less than minus one degree C. And this is starting to be indicative un of unstable permafrost. But permafrost uh, in the interior or boreal in Yukon and Alaska occupies perhaps about 60% uh, of the landscape. So we we characterize it as being discontinuous. And the distribution of permafrost in this area um, is primarily due to ecological factors as the climate itself can be relatively uniform across the landscape. And this distribution of permafrost on north facing slopes and toe, toe slopes of uh, hillsides to isolated patch or discontinuous patches on the flats these are probably primarily driven by differences in topography, hydrology, soils, and vegetation. And I want to just uh, simply illustrate three very different types of permafrost across this boreal landscape. Here we have uh, 
ecosystem-driven permafrost in rocky uplands that reforms repeatedly after fires. And we might accumulate a, a half to one meter of ice uh, that can cause the ground to thaw about that much when it thaws. In a very different and, and unique type of permafrost are uh, the type we, care, we term yetama in uh, silky uplands. And this is a climate-driven ecosystem protected. It formed in the very cold temperatures of the late Pleistocene, but is able to be, persist due to the uh, environment uh, created by uh, ecosystems and uh, other ecological characteristics. But there's a huge amount of ice in this uh, type of permafrost. There uh, can be potentially 10 to 30 meters of thaw settlement uh, if this is to thaw out. And then we have a uh, another type of permafrost, of ecosystem-driven permafrost that goes through cycles of bogs and fens. And there may be about one to three meters of ice in this type of terrain. So this variety of ice and its characteristics um, has big implications on how the landscape responds to its, how it thaws. And I wanna just illustrate uh, four, three types of, of, of ecosystem responses. Here are the uh, thermocarst fen with drowning forests. Uh, they are just south of Fairbanks. I can look out my window and look at the uh, Tanana Flats uh, on the other side of Fairbanks. And then uh, we have also some glaciated uh, landscapes, uh, both in Alaska and in Yukon Northwest Territories. And here's an illustration of a a mega thaw slump in glacial till, and this can have huge, this type of uh, slumping and degradation can have huge effects on uh, water quality. And then the lower left, we have a thaw slump after fire on this uh, Yetama that I just previously talked about. So you could have uh, large portions of hillsides uh, slumping after the immediate uh, shock of a fire. And then I wanna illustrate uh, some uh, implications or responses of society. And here's an example of road reconstruction uh, going on uh, right on the road below my house where uh, they're trying to uh, install four inches of insulation in the road bed. And this is an adaptation strategy just to slow down the damage. It, you're not going to be able to prevent the uh, thawing over time, especially with warming, but it allows you to recoup some of your investment in your in infrastructure by just trying to slow it down. So I think uh, that's where I'll leave it for my portion. I uh, appreciate your attention. Awesome, thanks Tor. And um, it's always pretty uh, eye-opening to see those, those photos about really the, the implications of permafrost thaw, it's a, it's a big problem that <laughs> it's only gonna get worse. Um, so it's really good to have that information available. Um, thank you. And next up is gonna be uh, Doug Clark. Um, and he's gonna talk about two different chapters, um, both on novel ecosystems and then also evolving rules for scientists and managers. Thanks, Leanna. And uh, my slide should be coming up in a moment. If someone could give me a, some kind of signal. Okay, great, there thank you. All right, good afternoon, everybody. I'm coming to you from down in Saskatoon on Treaty 6 traditional territory and the homeland of the Métis. So I was involved in a couple of different chapters that had very different uh, emphases, but, but a, a really common underlying thread about change and coping with it. And the first of these chapters I worked on with John Morton, Don Reed, uh, and Dylan Beach. Dylan was a master's student with me uh, just, just prior to, uh, to getting this chapter up and running with people. And we looked at the whole emergent phenomenon of, of novel communities and, and uh, ecological communities and trophic assemblies in the Northwest Boreal region. And, and the shorthand for this phenomenon is really often novel ecosystems. And uh, one of our first uh, big picture realizations as, as we were putting things together 
was that uh, novel ecosystems are not exactly a new thing um, in, in this region. This is a region that has undergone uh, substantial ecological change regularly over, over a long period of time, and the ecosystems have changed with it. A lot of what we think about when we, when we conceptualize these new ecosystem states is species changes. This is a view looking down on the Haynes Road uh, from up on Cluckshoe Mountain, west towards Kluwani National Park. Uh, and this was a few years ago. And you'll you'll notice that amongst the green, there's a, a healthy number or well, healthy is probably the wrong way to describe it. But there's a significant number of red stems uh, among the spruces there. There's probably more now. Uh, and this is uh, courtesy of the spruce beetle eruption that, uh, that took place in the late 90s, early 2000s uh, in this region and, and right across uh, the, the Northwest Boreal, or at least the, the Southern, probably you know, half to a third of it. Uh, the Kenai Peninsula in, encountered the, the same thing and had just profound, profound ecological change resulting from uh, activity of this one insect species. But there are other species changes on the landscape. And uh, Dylan and I did some work in uh, sort of the middle of the past decade with the ALSEC Renewable Resource Council uh, and with a couple of technical teams from uh, uh, made up of the Yukon government, federal government, First Nation governments and resource councils, uh, the bison and the elk technical teams. And we uh, worked through a participatory scenario planning process where participants identified what they expected would be the drivers of change in the region in the southwest Yukon uh, and then looked at uh, what potential plausible futures might look like and really then started thinking about well how do we feel about those different plausible futures and what can we uh, what can we do to understand whether we're heading towards them or away from them so this was essentially trialing uh, a planning tool that could potentially help us help us all uh, do a better job of, of planning under uh, accelerating changing conditions. Um, this uh, set of four panels each graphically uh, summarizes different uh, four different scenarios that the participants came up with. Um, and I should acknowledge Tanya Handley for uh, producing these graphics. Uh, Tanya is based out of Whitehorse. So participants identified um, cumulative impacts, um, the predictable or unpredictable nature of change, uh, and exploitative or stewardship orientations in management systems as, as the real underlying drivers. And so, for example, if you look in the upper left, um, you'll see a graphic depiction of a high cumulative impact scenario with unpredictable environmental change and an exploitive regime in place. If you look in the lower right, you'll see a, uh, a scenario depicted that has low cumulative impacts more gradual uh, ecological change and a stewardship ethos driving its, uh, its, its management approaches. And in each of these, the, the elements describe what you see more of and what you see less of. And this leads into the second chapter, which is one that I, I, uh, I worked on with Don Magnus. Uh, and, and just as the, um, the, the people we worked with on that participatory scenario planning exercise uh, were learning different, uh, different methods, um, learning has become a, a pretty big role or a pretty big part of the role of scientists and managers, not just in the Northwest Boreal region, but uh, well, globally, really. Um, and it's not just learning more about the particular disciplinary specialties that people have or their particular thematic area of specialization. We're, we're still probably, well, maybe hopefully at the tail end of an era where the dominant paradigm for scientists and managers in resource management is something called scientific management. Uh, now, if you aren't familiar with the origins of that term, you might think, what could possibly be wrong with that? Um, turns out in this context, quite a lot. This approach was originally invented by a researcher named Frederick Taylor over 100 years ago, uh, and of course, uh, got named after him as an approach, Taylorism. Works really, really well um, if you're trying to devise a means to optimize manual labor in factories in the industrial revolution. So what this is really all about, it's a, a hierarchical mechanistic view of science as a provider of knowledge that can then be unproblematically implemented in a, in a hierarchical institution. Um, it's also the fundamental paradigm underlying all the environmental management institutions or virtually all um, in the Northwest Boreal region and worldwide. And, it, and it's remarkably durable, 
Um, it had its roots in the, in the very laudable desire to rise above some very, very partisan uh, 19th century politics over resource use, which is where the uh, also the the um, the era where the idea of agency capture came from, the idea that scientists must be objective so that they aren't actually too influenced by people that deal on a daily basis with the resource that the scientist specializes in. Uh, you might catch the slight hint of irony in my voice and the, the small contradiction in that statement. Um, this, however, scientific management is still widely presumed and taught to this day uh, as the one best way to approach natural resource management. And here's the rub. Um, if you were on the, the wrong side of scientific management regime, uh, it was a distinctly unpleasant place to be. And many folks, uh, dominantly indigenous people who lived in the North, live in the Northwest Boreal region, did spend a long time on the, on the, the, the wrong side of such a regime. Um, and things have changed. And, and what we see as a result, partly of those changes and partly as a re result of a whole lot of other things going on is that it's become much clearer over the past two decades that scientific management is highly vulnerable to failure when it's applied to complex problems with social and ecological dimensions. So what are we maybe potentially, hopefully moving towards? Well, about 15 years ago, Ron Bruner, Toddy Steelman, and a group of their colleagues in the lower 48 uh, identified a paradigm that they described as adaptive governance to differentiate it from scientific management. And what they saw was an emergent response to repeated failures of scientific management across the US. Uh, and, and one particular uh, problem they, they, they were really concerned with was the policy gridlock that they saw in which, uh, you know, still continues to be a, another durable feature of, uh, of, um, of American resource management systems. Management by lawsuit is, is a, a high friction way to do things. And they, they pointed out that adaptive governance is not just scientific management done right, it's different. Uh, it's also not a prescription, and they definitely don't say, here's the recipe, uh, nor is it a guarantee of success. Um, what's been really interesting in the Northwest Boreal region is that uh, the indigenous context in this region, the settlement of land claims, uh, ANILCA, ANCSA, the, the, the big legislative pieces that shape the policy landscape and which Annette and Scott will be talking about in a moment, accelerated transition in the region towards adaptive governance. Um, and so what we see now is a set of, of interconnected um, resource, resource co-management institutions, uh, probably with varying degrees of co, uh, but they, they look much more like networks and much less like hierarchies, although the hierarchies are still there. Um, as well, there, there's a, a profound degree of self-organization uh, in these governance systems. Uh, and while there may be some top-down changes that change the landscape that they evolve in, uh, it's not so much a top-down prescription that's created these new institutions. So taken together, what this means is that the Northwest Boreal region is one of the more interesting places on the continent, if not in the world, uh, for looking at this transition and looking at and understanding the, the evolving roles of scientists and managers in adaptive governance for uh, social ecological systems. Thanks so much, Doug. That was awesome. Um, and you always managed to cover a lot of info in a, a concise way that's understandable. Thank you for that. Um, and then we're gonna move forward to Annette and she's gonna talk about values and ethics in resource management. And then also talk some more about um, the chapter on engaging communities. All right, thanks, Dr. Liana. Weston, you're up. <laughs> All right, thanks, Liana. Um, get my show going. And yeah, like Doug, I'm going to be talking about two chapters that I had the pleasure of and honor of taking part in. Um, one being with Doug Clark, who, uh, who also was my co-author in this as well. And our chapter was values and ethics in resource management institutions. The main driving argument in the chapter is that individual and organizational values and ethics are often the unseen driver of social ecological systems. And we talk in our chapter and summarize a lot of research in conservation social science that articulates the ways that this is so. And we provide an illustrative example of how values and ethics can, 
can be a driver uh, in the system with, with the wood bison story, where you can see um, the wood bison reintroduction happening and causing controversy in two different national contexts in different ways. And so the question is, what really is natural within a changing boreal forest is differently interpreted in Alaskan institutions. The Alaska Department of Fish and Game immediately talked about reintroduction of wood bison, uh, while the US Fish and Wildlife Service would talk instead about total introduction, not recognizing uh, that prior thousands of years ago, wood bison occupation of that landscape is also natural. So the term natural is, is something that is under contestation as a value. In Canada, uh, as by contrast, there wasn't nearly as much controversy uh, as, as there was in Alaska for the wood bison example. And so our findings in this chapter articulate, um, you know, coping with environmental change is hard uh, because values are set based on what is, not what might be in the future. Uh, values and ethics not only inform managers about what species composition to strive for, but also inform individual choices that affect landscape change. Values not only define resource management issues, they drive what information is gathered to support management actions. And so we articulate that applied social science provides a very capable toolbox for people to unpack these values and ethics within their own institutions, as well as a tool for understanding the values and ethics of other entities and cultures. And we also provide a, a schematic model of how we think about this driver of values and ethics and knowledge production. Uh, we live within a world of social ecological resilience and transformation, uh, but as nature changes, so do human identities, cultures, and values that are responding to those changes. Uh, managers can work uh, with communities for effective landscape conservation planning within that context uh, through adaptive management driven by science community partnerships. And that leads me to uh, the next chapter that I had the pleasure of working on, which is Meaningfully Engaging Communities with David Natcher. And in that chapter, our main argument was that it's time to, for all Western scientists to, to, to take indigenous knowledge seriously uh, and to meaningfully engage with communities is to recognize that, that TEK or IK is an internally valid knowledge system and that agencies and researchers need to more effectively co-produce knowledge of our changing social ecological systems. And in the chapter, we uh, talk a lot about the, the, the research done by both indigenous and non-indigenous scholars on the topic of, of this bridge. Uh, we identify the following information gaps and, and things to work for in the future. Uh, researchers need to assess whether tribal organizations or First Nations have the fiscal, fiscal capacity to administer research collaborative relationships and to, in, and to shape our, our grant budgets to enable that capacity. Uh, traditional management practices by indigenous peoples and the TEK or IK uh, in the different areas of the Northwest Boreal region need to be understood prior to developing research questions. Funding cycles and grant writing procedures need to be reformulated to encourage iterative research designs, knowledge co-production, and really to reflect the time it takes to do rigorous community-based work. Researchers could, should carefully align their theories with uh, the philosophical assumptions of the local culture. For example, research on nonlinear social ecological systems is often more compatible with IK or TEK than research assuming linear change. Yet more work is certainly needed to be done to bridge these approaches to knowledge of ecosystem management. And so that's my very quick summary of two different chapters that I took part of. Thanks so much, Annette. And um, again, it's, it's really awesome that this book covers a whole gamut of um, oftentimes, you know, we've gotten in the trap of thinking of just about the natural science. 
um, when approaching these issues for many, many, many decades. And, and it's really great to see the, the shift and that it's embodied in, in this, um, in the book. Um, so next up is Scott Slocum, and he's going to be diving into uh, law and policy in terms of drivers of change. Okay, thank you. I think you should be able to see my slides. Um, and I will say at the I will say at the start that this chapter was, this draws on the chapter that was done with Julie Lerman Julie, who was then at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and is very much the expert on Alaska law. So uh, if there are detailed questions about that, uh, I might have to pass on them. Um, I want to talk uh, about four slides, context, uh, law, policy, and interactions. Um, to draw from the chapter, as well as a few comments, maybe in the years, drawing from the years since. Um, clearly at the root of talking about law and policy drivers here is that Canada and the US are quite different at a national level or federal level, but also at sub-national level, Alaska, Yukon, NWT, and BC are also all quite different. Yukon and Alaska and NWT maybe have the closest differences, but, or similarities, but there are significant differences in government and law and policy. And we see that structurally in terms of government structures, the laws, policies, indigenous titles and rights and roles, uh, but also you know, more fluidly in terms of the evolution of some of those things through time and particularly things like policies and priorities and plans of different governments and agencies uh, through the years and culturally, though arguably there are cultural similarities across the Northwest Boreal um, relative to other places. Um, but all of these things affect law and policy and how they evolve uh, or are implemented uh, in practice, right? From a legal perspective, um, we talked about how changes in legal structure can have important consequences for uh, the Northwest Boreal social ecological system. Um, and a highlight that international agreements are very much a part of the framework for management decisions. Uh, and that particularly probably was referencing wildlife treaties and more species specific uh, management plans, some of which you know, certainly do cross borders within the Northwest Boreal. Um, beyond that, legal owner land ownership patterns, diversity of agencies at multiple levels, um, clearly matter and increasingly, and, and maybe a bit more on the Canadian side than on the American, but not only, uh, legal conflicts between federal, state, provincial, territorial uh, le <coughs> levels and indigenous and other governments also matter. And in the Canadian context, very much uh, the comprehensive land claims, modern treaty agreements and Supreme Court of Canada decisions um, are key, and the latter in particular are increasingly interpreting and modifying um, both the implications of comprehensive land claim agreements and land and resource management in places without comprehensive land claim agreements. Um, on the policy side, uh, you know, we highlight a few areas, uh, and some of these notably perhaps protected areas uh, and transboundary ones, some of which have been around for quite a long time in this region, but increasingly in the last five or six years, also indigenous and locally conserved areas of different kinds are becoming an increasingly important area of policy. Um, wildlife management and harvesting have been central uh, for quite a long time in this region, uh, for better and or worse uh, for different groups. And resource development uh, clearly remains an area of uh, policy controversy uh, from you know, government policies which encourage uh, resource development to environmental assessment and more sustainability oriented policies, along with challenges created by reclamation and restoration of uh, both old and relatively recent mines which end up abandoned, right? Lands, forests, agriculture, renewable resources have been 
uh, seeing more attention in different places, some of it tied to perhaps to climate warming, but there's a long history of uh, hopeful agricultural development in the Northwest Boreal, um, along with forest development, uh, well, more actual on the Alaska side and hopeful on the Canadian side, um, along with lands and issues around land access for a wide range of activities in different places. Uh, and climate change related policies and actions are, have also been around for a while, have had their ups and downs in parts of the Northwest Boreal uh, over the last decade, uh, but are perhaps are going to become increasingly important uh, in the coming years across the Northwest Boreal. All right. And then to just leave with a few comments around interactions. Clearly, effective intergovernmental relations are needed um, uh, across the range of jurisdictions and the range of government, le government levels and governance organizations. Um, implementation of a wide range of laws and agreements and policies is key to moving forward and seeking to achieve broader societal goals in this region. Among those key areas is the relationship between co-management and other approval processes uh, in the region, along with a strong push towards more communication and collaboration between federal governments uh, in this region, which of course has been challenging at times uh, in recent years, uh, but may perhaps uh, a lot, we may perhaps be able to be a little more optimistic uh, in the future years. And so in terms of leaving with a single uh, key point or takeaway, I would say law, policy, practice are constantly changing and interaction and communication between and within governance scales are critical for um, making drivers work the way you want for understanding what the drivers are uh, and moving forward. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Scott. Um, and then our final speaker is going to be Dr. Nancy Fresco, who's going to talk about the interactions of all of these things. So, you know, the pretty simple stuff. <laughs> That was an ironic statement. <laughs> I think, um, Nancy, you might be muted. We see your screen now. Yes, sorry, I was trying to unmute, but I think you can hear me now. <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> and um, go, I was just trying to get that. There we go. Um, so yes, the, the, um, yeah, the ironically entirely easy task of, of wrapping this all up. Uh, in truth, um, the speakers who have come before me have already um, made great inroads into talking about how all this fits together. Um, it's really tricky, uh, even with a, a number of us speakers and with a whole hour to, to fit this into, um, we still are barely scratching the surface of what's covered in the book. Um, in terms of stepping through, you know, we started with Tor talking about permafrost. Um, my specialty, I'm a biologist, I, I look at forest ecosystems primarily, but I've been working for many years now, 14 years now, um, here at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, um, which is on the Trothiavik campus on Athabascan um, land uh, here in uh, what we call central Alaska. Um, but the, you know, the, the, the complexities of, um, of linking between um, the, uh, the social sciences um, through every layer of the biophysical sciences um, is really daunting. Um, and working in the climate change field as I do, um, climate change ties all those things together, but it also adds another layer of complexity, of course. Um, and so having a background in, in, in science, the urge is always to try and uh, put numbers on that, um, to try and quantify things. Um, and that has um, both pluses and minuses. So. Um, this is, uh, this is kind of the, the, the nightmare diagram that ties together or attempts to tie together a lot of what the speakers who came before me uh, were attempting to talk about and what I'm attempting to talk about and what the book is attempting to talk about. Um, just this incredible 
complexity that takes place between um, governmental institutions, the rules we make, the laws we make, the way we manage things, uh, climate change, which is ongoing and which is um, having strong effects on not just the governmental institutions, but vice versa. And then of course that, that the green components of this diagram, the landscape itself, uh, the ecosystem, which starts with uh, you know, the underground, goes all the way up into the atmosphere, um, all those layers of landscape complexity. And you know, as you can see from the somewhat um, torturous lines in this diagram, there are many, many feedbacks between these components, both within each color um, and, and between the three. Um, so these different aspects of climate change have um, intrinsic feedback loops that exacerbate uh, climate change. Um, and then the government itself um, has both positive and negative feedback loops, and then what happens on the landscape likewise. Um, untangling that and turning that into any kind of workable model is um, is really you know immensely challenging um, for those for whom the um, spaghetti diagram uh, is more is more uh, confusing than it is elucidating. Um, there's th there's this way of looking at things which, um, even though it's a little confusing because so many of these boxes are both pluses and minuses or merely question marks, it at least allows those with numeric brains like my own to to um, start thinking um, piece by piece about some of the biggest drivers of change, um, things that we actually see happening like here in Alaska and Central Alaska, increased wildfire frequency, um, increases in permafrost thaw. You know, uh, Tora's expertise, uh, things like surface water availability. So things that people living on the landscape report back and talk about and say, this is affecting my life, this is affecting um, my subsistence, this is affecting infrastructure and the economies that depend on that. Um, how do those things affect one another? Do they have a positive effect on one another, a negative effect, or confusingly sometimes both or an unknown effect? Um, and sometimes pulling out just one box from this diagram and um, running a study, um, doing an investigation on that um, can actually start uh, help to help to untangle that, that spaghetti diagram. Sometimes a single case study um, can shed light on that. Um, and others before me have mentioned um, some of these particular studies, some of these particular ongoing discussions. Uh, the case study that I'm um, uh, throwing up here is uh, kind of an interesting one that I stumbled upon in um, some of my work on ecosystems, landscapes, and the ties to climate change. Um, one issue when you're trying to connect with policymakers, when you're trying to talk about the urgency of climate change in particular, you say, oh, you know, it's getting three degrees warmer or it's getting five degrees warmer. And even if people don't try to deny that that's happening, you show them the data, you say, this is happening, it's, it's, this, it's this much warmer, you end up with this question of, of so what? Um, you know, what does that mean in terms of what people care about, in terms of um, effects that are larger than a, a small sounding number? You know, three degrees increase in, in temperature might sound positive to some people, and we're talking about northern climates after all. Um, or it might sound inconsequential. It doesn't. It doesn't have a so what attached to it. Um, but when you start making those linkages, connecting those lines in the diagram, um, this particular uh, case study was was looking at um, changes in um, uh, temperature as they relate to the abundance of um, beaver across uh, a particular landscape that we were examining at the time in um, in Alaska. So a very particular region and space and time and species. But what was interesting about it is that the data for this actually came from Canada, where a hardworking uh, graduate student had actually measured the relationship between increased temperature and beaver populations and found that even a small increase causes a very large increase beaver populations and of course beavers like human like humans um alter the landscape they they build dams they dam waterways that in turn changes hydrology changes uh, people's interactions on the landscape um so it's just one small example of how you when you dig into the story behind the data um you can sometimes find something um really interesting going on that you didn't know about and also how it ties back to 
people's very particular experiences. Um, so people living on the landscape might know about the increases they're seeing in beaver populations, but that particular change might not be drawn into that full model, that full story, um, until all the avenues are explored. Um, and so it, this is a learning, learning curve for all of us. Um, the fact that there are 60 authors in this book is, uh, is not a coincidence. Um, there could have been many, many more. Um, and there's so much knowledge out there on these landscapes, um, so much traditional knowledge, um, so much research still being done. Uh, and it's a joy and a pleasure to get to collaborate with so many people across boundaries um, and not be siloed in an academic space. So um, I'll close with that. And um, hopefully we have a little time. We're, we're five minutes from the end. So <laughs> that doesn't leave much um, for, for questions. Uh, but this is, you know, as others have said, um, you know, a very, a very, very broad field. Um, so hopefully this will not just be a one hour session, but will be an open, <laughs> Uh, an open conversation between many. Thanks all. Thanks so much, Nancy. Um, and just before we jump into Q&A, um, I just wanted to thank C. Joe Smith, um, who's with the Northern Latitudes Partnerships, which of which the Northwest Boreal is a part of. Um, she did an amazing job of pulling together all of the, the presenters today and getting doing cat herding and making this webinar possible. So thank you, C. Joe. Um, and I think Sabrina is going to, yeah, facilitate us through some Q&A. Thanks, Sabrina. Thank you. And thanks to all the speakers. Uh, that was that was great. And uh, certainly a lot of uh, ground covered in a relatively short amount of time. Um, so I'm happy to keep the conversation going a few extra minutes so that we can have uh, time for a few questions or comments. And uh, I'll ask people to uh, try to use the, rate, the hand raise function if you can find that. Uh, if you can't and want to turn your camera on or just put and put your hand up in your screen, I'll look for that. Or you can flag it in the uh, flag your question in the comments, either write it in there directly or just note that you have a question you'd like to raise. And we'll get to as many people as we can. Phil? Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to provide a little comment on the history and development of this book, uh, as witnessed by uh, several of the, the speakers there. Uh, it, it's interesting in that it evolved to take on a much more uh, a broader consideration of social issues than perhaps we originally envisioned. I don't know if Amanda would agree with me, but, the, but at the beginning, I think we were envisioning drivers of change in the Northwest to be driven largely by climate change and resource development. And um, I was charged with uh, organizing the socioeconomic section, which was a little bit out of my depth. So I learned lots, that was good. But it was really with Don Magnus's help that we brought in people like Annette and Scott to, uh, to fill that out. And even before uh, those extra chapters were added, I was really impressed by how much uh, change in the region was driven by external factors, whether it was the, the European colonization exercise to begin with, or military events around the world, or pollution, or the price of gold. You know, so much of what happens in the region is, is out of our hands. And that's even was true of the story of the, the Northwest Boreal Partnership and trying to get it published. I mean, that was another exercise in humility and adaptability and resilience that I think we can, we can take as a model going forward for not just resource management, but institutional management in the future. So I just wanted to add that that perspective from from the inside and from the from the overall writing of the project. Yeah, uh, thanks, Phil. I guess I, I'm I, I appreciate that comment because I was involved in the beginning and then sort of lost track near the end. And so it was pretty exciting when it arrived in this form. Um, and I agree with the scope like I I haven't opened it up enough yet, and I'm so excited now. Um, I, so I really appreciate this webinar for reminding me of the scope of it. But the other thing that really struck me, I feel like we're just doing sales jobs here, but I'm excited about it. It's great. Um, when I opened it was the, 
the conciseness and the consistency among the chapters. And I had forgotten that we discussed that at the beginning as a really tight way to package the information and make it accessible and make it consistent. Um, and I don't exactly remember that conversation, but that was a great decision because I think it really, it really works well. So that's my yay. Congratulations, everyone. I, it's exciting. Thanks, Hillary. Um, I'm just looking around for hands up for um, Joe, did you? Yeah. yeah my, uh, thank you very much for a very informative uh, presentation. Also, um, a very uh, informative book. My question is. Out of the 70, 65 authors, how many were Indigenous? If, if it's a very low percentage, then it would you tell me that the story is half told and that uh, with the Indigenous TK in participation, that um, you can do a lot regards to the work that has to be done edu educating public about um, the dire need of collaborative planning and decision making in the near future. Thank you, Joe. I, I really appreciate that question and, and for your interest and in, and asking it, and you're absolutely right. The the, um, the percentage of, of native authorship is quite low. And I think that is uh, an extension of the colonialism that Phil and, and Hillary referred to. Uh, and, and, and the authors themselves, when they talked about the, um, the changing role of science and management and how the, the science-based management uh, system has been overlaid on on all of our backgrounds and training for so long that uh, you know the the people who are engaged oftentimes are not the people that should be at the table. I'm not saying that the people that are at the table shouldn't be there because they should, but they shouldn't be the only ones that should be much more encompassing. And early on in the the partnership, there was from the very beginning was a um, an open arms and and very very much a um a uh extension to all of the community members to join the partnership and to be at the table be decision makers and and with the equal voices as anybody else and it's taken a few years for those relationships to be built for trust to be built and um, i'm going to pass it over to liana to report out on some more recent work that the partnership has been doing that um, it, it, to be honest, it was, uh, you know, seven or eight years in the making to get to the point where we are now. And hopefully if we do a revision of this volume in a few years from now, that authorship demographic will look a lot different. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Amanda. And I think, you know, the, the whole evolution of the partnership itself has been rapidly changing. Um, we did start off being pretty heavy with um, folks who were in government, um, universities who are non-Indigenous with the partnership, um, but were who, who very much you know, wanted to establish those relationships, build that trust. And so um, particularly over the last three years, we've been rapidly um, moving in that direction. And you know, we now have an all um, Indigenous uh, leadership team, and we've been working on a number of projects that um, pretty much all of our projects now are um, in collaboration with Indigenous leaders that are supporting Indigenous-led stewardship. Um, and, and Joe, you're familiar with some of this work that we're doing. And yeah, absolutely, you know, if this book were being written today, um, I think that we're all in a much more um, we're all becoming a lot more aware of who's leading what projects. And so we would have, you know, a different, um, uh, we would have a, a different number of indigenous authors 
at the table, but I really appreciate you bringing that up. And it's always good to, to hear from you, Joe, and to see you. Um, thank you for, the, for that question and those responses. Um, uh, I did want to just uh, flag in case people aren't monitoring the chat, Nancy Fresco had to leave, but she did uh, invite people who have questions for her to email her at um, nlfresco at alaska.edu. Um, and also, uh, I just wanted to share a comment from Bob uh, that he had to leave early, but uh, he wanted to mention a couple of projects that he thought would be connected to this work, uh, the, working on the work plan for the Arctic Council's Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program, uh, an assessment of the societal implications of climate change and uh, conservation, a joint AMAP conservation of Arctic flora and fauna assessment of the impact of climate change on Arctic ecosystems. Um, he thinks that the work that the Northwest Boreal has done is an excellent model of how to do things right uh, and invites um, that group to contact him if you're interested uh, as your work continues to unfold. Um, and I'll just, um, oh, I see a new message. Okay, okay, thank you, Leanna. So in the chat, you'll see actually num everyone's emails uh, shared, uh, all of the speakers' emails are shared there uh, for folks who do wanna reach out. Um, I'm happy to uh, leave time for a couple of more questions if people have them. And I am looking for hands raised. And if not, then uh, thank you so much uh, again to our speakers and to everyone who joined us today. Uh, that was a, a great presentation and, and a good discussion. And uh, uh, I look forward to uh, following your work as you uh, potentially continue to collaborate down the road. Thanks awesome. so much. Thanks, thanks for hosting Sabrina and thanks to all of our authors who um, got this book together and for the to the authors that presented today. And, and thank, thank you again, to Joe. <laughs> hurting the cat. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Bye, everyone. I hope the rest of your day goes well. Thank you all. Goodbye. Bye, Take everyone. care, everybody. Bye. Take care.